Welcome to Electron Online, and now the key to finding the correct value for the Hubble, uh, Hubble constant. And it's not so much that it's the correct value, because we never really will find the correct value, but we want to get as close as possible with a small, as small as possible of an experimental error. And the key to doing that was the Cepheid variables, because Cepheid variables, just like the RR Lyra variables, have very consistent periodic changes in the, in the luminosity of the star. And again, these are red giants, but larger red giants than the RR Lyra stars, and they pulsate at periods anywhere from 1 to 100 days. But what's so great about Cepheid variables is that their, that their luminosity is linearly proportional to the periodicity of their periods. For Cepheid variables that have a variable, um, uh, like a pulse, that vary in luminosity, that's a better way to say it, that vary in luminosity uh, on average like one day or more, uh, they have a luminosity or they have an absolute magnitude of about minus two. But Cepheid variables that vary over a period of 100 days have an absolute magnitude of minus eight. And the linearity between those two is very, very accurate. So therefore, all we have to do is find the Cepheid variable, watch the periodicity, so they become brighter and dimmer and brighter and dimmer, so the period is anywhere from 1 to 100 days. And so what we do is we find one, we measure the periodicity. Once we find the periodicity, we then go over here and find the absolute magnitude. Once we find the absolute magnitude, we then have to measure the apparent magnitude, and by using those two values, we can actually find the distance to that Cepheid variable fairly accurately. And if that Cepheid variable uh, exists in another galaxy, we then know the distance to that galaxy, and then we can look at its recessional velocity, and from that figure out the Hubble constant. So again, what we're going to do, we're going to measure a whole bunch of Cepheid variables. We're going to, therefore, find the distance to the galaxies that they're in. We're going to note the recessional velocity of these galaxies. So on the vertical axis, we have velocity. On the horizontal axis, we have distance. We then come connect those with the best fit line, and then we measure the slope of that line, and the slope of the line will be equal to the Hubble constant. By doing that, the value that we got for, these, uh, for, these, uh, for the Hubble constant ended up being somewhere between 60 to 80 kilometers per second per megaparsec, with again, the current accepted value falls right in between those two values, so we began to become very accurate in establishing the Hubble constant using Cepheid variables. There's only one problem. A Cepheid variable still is a single star, and to measure the intensity or the luminosity of a single star that are millions of light years away in another galaxy is very difficult to do, especially with Earthbound telescopes. The best Earthbound, uh, Earthbound telescopes at the time could find could measure objects with a magnitude of about plus 22. So how far away can we see an object that has a magnitude of plus 22? Well, let's see here. If the absolute magnitude is somewhere between minus 2 and minus 8, how much brighter is that? Okay, so again, we're going to try and find the distance at which we can see an object that's at minus 2 and an object that's minus 8. So the way we do that is we find the apparent magnitude, which, of course, this becomes the apparent magnitude. We're going to look for one as far away as possible. So the apparent magnitude will be plus 22, and the absolute magnitude will be, let's start with the dimmest of the Cepheid variables, a minus 2, so that the delta M is equal to 24. So the next thing we do is we find the difference in the intensity, which is equal to 2.512 raised to the delta m power, which is equal to 2.512 uh, raised to the 24 power, which is, and with a calculator, let's find out what that is equal to. That's 2.512 uh, raised to the 24 power. That's equal to, mm, let's see here, that's equal to uh, 3.99 times 10 to the 9th. Of course, then to find the distance to uh, the farthest distance that we can see that with a telescope like this, that means the distance is equal to 10 parsecs times the square root of the difference in the intensity. So it's equal to 10 parsecs times the square root of 3.99 times 10 to the 9th. So let's take the square root of that times 10 parsecs. And let's see here, that would be equal to, hmm, that would be equal to um, 0 
point, yeah, 0 0.6 megaparsecs, which is about 2 million light years, 2 mega light years. That's not very far. So the dim Cepheid variables can only be seen at the maximum distance of about 2 million light years. Well, what about the very bright uh, Cepheid variables, the one that have a magnitude of minus 8? So let, let me use a different color for that. Let me try green. All right, so then at that point, we have, and I'm trying to get the cap of my pen. There we go. So instead of a, mag a magnitude of minus 2, we now have a magnitude of minus 8, which is a difference of 30. So that means we're going to change this to a 30, and so we're now going to get a new value for the difference in intensities between seeing it at 10 parsecs and seeing it where it actually is. So 2.512 raised to the 30th power, uh, that's equal to um, 1.00 times 10 to the 12th. Then we plug that value in here, and so now we get 1.00 times 10 to the 12th. We take the square root of that, multiply times 10, and what do we get? Uh, we get that is equal to 10 megaparsec, 10 million parsec, which is about 31.6 million light years. So with the best, biggest telescopes in the world, we can see a single Cepheid variable that has an absolute magnitude of minus 8, so the type that have periodicities of 100 days, in galaxies 30, light year, 30 million light years away, which is a good thing because in that respect, we can go look at those galaxies far away, hope that we see a Cepheid variable, so we go searching. If we see variable stars, we'll measure the, the periodicity. Only the very brightest ones can be seen. We measure the length of the periodicity. Let's say it's one that has a periodicity of 90 days. We come over here, we see the absolute magnitude. We then uh, calculate the, the um, actual, the uh, apparent luminosity. So we compare the apparent luminosity to the uh, actual luminosity, the, the um, uh, actual magnitude of the star. We compare the two and then try to figure out the distance of that galaxy. And so we did that for a number of galaxies and we came up with this value right here from 60 to 80 kilometers per second. But yet, we were not satisfied that was just not good enough because we still couldn't narrow it down any better than that. What's the next step? We need a better telescope. One that can see things that have dimmer magnitudes than plus 22. And then we realized that an earthbound telescope could not accomplish that. Hence, let's put a telescope up in space. And that's why the idea came up to build the Hubble Space Telescope. The primary purpose for the Hubble Space Telescope was to go look for, you guessed it, Cepheid variables. But with the Hubble Space Telescope, we could see stars not, not just dim to plus 22, but dim to plus 30. That's another eight, eight uh, magnitudes dimmer, which means we could see Cepheid variables out to a distance of almost 100 million light years for the very bright ones. And that's what we wanted to do. So we built a Hubble Space Telescope, put it up in space. Yes, we took beautiful pictures with the Hubble Space Telescope, but we also were able to measure the Cepheid variables to even a greater distance. And by then, our better estimate then went down to 73 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And we owe this ability to come up with such an accurate value for the, Hubble's, for the Hubble constant by using the Hubble Space Telescope to hunt for Cepheid variables in galaxies 50 to 100 million light years away. So we took the measurement of a number of these, these uh, Cepheid variables over a wide range of galaxies, and we end up coming up with a much better value for the Hubble constant. And that's how we did that.